Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, so good afternoon uh, and welcome to the March 5 MND Scientific Seminar. Uh, my name is Sarah Bennett and I'm the Senior Research Coordinator at Fight MND. Uh, we hold these seminars monthly on the last Tuesday of the month. Uh, and in February, we heard from a leader in the MND care research space, Richard Kaye from the MND Association in the UK. Richard spoke to us about his research into assistive technologies to enhance communication for MND patients. Um, and if you'd like to hear this talk, but you missed out, uh, it is now available on our website, so you have, are able to catch up at a convenient time. So following the talk today, we are leaving plenty of time for discussion and questions. So if you would like to ask anything, please use your reaction button to raise your hand and one of our team will enable your microphone and camera and let you know to ask your question. Alternatively, you can also type your question into the chat where our team will be monitoring and read out questions on your behalf. Uh, please note that the chat function is only enabled if you are using the app-based version of Teams and unfortunately doesn't work if you are in the web-based version. Uh, please ensure you do introduce yourself and where you're from uh, so that we can all get to know each other before asking your question. Uh, so now to our presentation for today. Eclipse Therapeutics is a biotechnology company based in the USA. Their pipeline of therapeutic development focuses on neurodegenerative and gastrointestinal diseases through targeting of cellular stress, protein misfolding and inflammation. Ray, Ray Hook joins us today representing Eclipse. Uh, Ray is the CEO of Eclipse Therapeutics and brings with him a wealth of experience in the biopharmaceutical industry. He holds a Master's of Industrial Administration from Carnegie Mellon University and a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from the Pennsylvania State University. He joins us today to tell us about Eclipse's exciting ALS therapeutic M102 and how its promising preclinical data is leading towards imminent in-human trials. Uh, thank you, Ray, for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah, and I would like to very much thank uh, Devor and Beck and the entire Fight MND team who has been part of uh, our support here for the M102 program. And uh, the M102 program uh, from both a biology and original molecule side of things, um, uh, it came out of or has come out of uh, Dame Pamela Shaw's lab at the University of Sheffield in the UK. So our team at Eclipse and Pam's team at uh, Citran at Sheffield have been working hand in hand on the, the molecule, the biology, the testing, and all the things that have gone into the development of M102. So um, let me then just get started. Uh, so all, all of you know much about, I say, uh, ALS here, because I'm in the United States, but certainly, um, you know, around 2,000 uh, MND uh, Australian patients. And uh, the one point I wanted to make here is just that uh, M102, although we have data that shows its applicability in both uh, in the familiar ALS um, patient population, our target from a development side of things is really the sporadic ALS patient population. And so uh, a lot of the data we have here is focused in the sporadic area. And as we go forward, we're developing more and more uh, data, especially in the, the precision medicine and patient stratification areas that we're working on, again, focused on the sporadic uh, MND uh, patient population. So first, um, a, a little bit about uh, the targets. Um, this was originally, uh, M102 was an or originally discovered because of Pam and her team's interest in the NRF2 pathway and its dysregulation within uh, ALS or MND. And so what I'm showing here in, in the panel uh, is really some of the earliest evidence for the dysregulation of NRF2. Uh, and this was all done looking at the time at SOD1 gene 93A transfected uh, motor neuronal cells from mice and the specific NSC, um, NSC34 line. And so what you see here uh, in green are areas where 
um, uh, there's decreased expression in yellow, increased expression, and the various regulation uh, of the pathway uh, as one goes forward. And what was found in that early work is that you could correct the, the dysregulation of NRF2 uh, by pharmacological interactions, uh, probe molecules that were NRF2 activators that saw a, a correction or at least a tendency towards the correction of the dysregulation. Also in the uh, bottom panels is um, uh, a, again, early work showing that uh, using tissue from human uh, MND cases and a proteomics approach at the time, that uh, an NRF2 regulated mitochondrial enzyme, PDR uh, X3, was down regulated in this cellular model of MND uh, in motor neurons. And again, it was corrected uh, by a NRF2 electrophile that, and that activation um, corrected the dysregulation. Going on here, um, what you're seeing here are audio radiograms uh, of NRF2 in both uh, uh, from motor cortex, and this is all in post-mortem materials from five sporadic ALS cases and five age-matched controls. And so you're seeing um, for the ALS and the controls that uh, you're reducing the mRNA for NRF2 in the motor uh, cortex in the ALS versus the controls and the black bars of the audio uh, radiogram show statistical reduction uh, in the mRNA uh, in the ALS patients versus controls. And on the other side of that, uh, KEEP1 is a negative regulator for NRF2 and I'll show that uh, more in depth in a later slide but the uh, mRNA for KEEP1 is increased in the ALS samples versus the control samples. So this is then what led Pam and her team to then go looking with high throughput methods, high throughput screening methods, I should say, for uh, NRF2 activators. And so um, a little bit about M102 uh, to start off and uh, it was originally uh, discovered uh, in high throughput screens that Pam and her team did looking for those NRF2 activators. Subsequent to that, it was also found that the, the same molecule um, also activated the HSF1 uh, pathway as well. And so we've been working on both pathways and understanding the molecule and both pathways application within uh, MND. It is a once a day orally dosing molecule and we have uh, additional indications uh, based upon its NRF2 activity in Friedrich's ataxia, Parkinson's and Huntington's and potentially some other uh, disease areas. Um, from a regulatory perspective, we have orphan designations in the US and the EU, and we had, and we, we put together and completed an FDA pre-IND meeting, which then just allowed us to look at how the FDA looked at the molecule and looked at the data at the time, and what we had to produce uh, going forward to, to be able to file, in their case, an IND uh, in the United States was certainly the FDA's focus, but our plan is really to go forward with a phase one sad mad trial um, in Australia in 2024. So the status of the molecule right now is all of our IND enabling studies are completed. Uh, the GMP manufacturing is completed uh, and those IND enabling studies were really defined uh, uh, and um, you know, looked at in depth in terms of the FDA meeting to understand uh, what it would take to file uh, that regulatory, uh, for regulatory approval to move into a phase one sad mad study. And I'll talk more about that in a later slide as well. From an IP perspective, uh, the composition of matter patents around the molecule uh, were filed and they have issued in the United States. They're still pending in other geographies. 
uh, and that goes to 2040 from a patent life perspective. And overall, we have five different patent families, including PK and uh, route of administration and uh, biology formulation and patient stratification. Whoops, I'm sorry. I'm looking at one while I have a screen. My apologies. In uh, uh, It took us a little bit of uh, um, messing around to get the, um, uh, the presentation working on the platform. So my apologies that I didn't uh, go forward there. So anyway, I'll be more careful going. All right, so what are the targets? Um, what M102 is, is an electrophile where uh, essentially oxidation of the M102 molecule causes it to create an orthoquinone. And so it's the M102 orthoquinone that's actually the active moiety in terms of engaging with targets. And so uh, first on the NRF2 side of things, the NRF2 is a transcription factor that normally is bound to keep one. And one, when M102 orthoquinone is introduced into the biological system, it actually binds with keep one which then frees the NRF2 transcription factor to translocate to the nucleus and upregulate the various genes that NRF2 upregulation uh, uh, you know, causes. In a similar fashion, on the HSF1 side of things, uh, the M102 orthoquinone actually binds with HSP90. Normally, the HSF1 transcription factor is bound into a complex that includes HSP90, but then the, the binding of the orthoquinone to the HSP90 frees the transcription factor, uh, and HSF1 then translocates into the uh, nucleus and upregulates the various genes that uh, HSF1 um, uh, does upregulate. So from a pathomechanism side of things, um, the circle that you see in the center and the specific pathomechanisms that you see on the right part of this slide are all from a Nature Review article uh, by Pam Shaw and her various co-authors. And you can see all the different pieces, at least as defined uh, in that Nature Review article, of uh, of ALS or MND. So uh, uh, obviously, as we all know here, a, a complex disease. And we have genetic data um, uh, and other in vitro data showing that when one activates NRF2, you're actually having effects on the pathomechanism as shown in the blue circle in all cases, reducing, reducing oxidative stress, reducing neuroinflammation, reducing mitochondrial dysfunction, et cetera. And when you activate HSF1, um, you then have uh, uh, application or effects in terms of the pathomechanism shown in the green or teal uh, circle or half circle that you see here on the slide. So we're taking with this molecule very much a multiple pathomechanism approach in trying to address the disease from a, a broader perspective. And if we look at the current uh, drugs on the market, at least in the United States, they're shown here in yellow. In Rilazole is predominantly a uh, excitotoxicity drug. Adavarone is a reducing an oxidative stress drug. And the Amylex drug um, is, as you I probably all know, two, two different drugs in the same treatment, one going after ER stress and one going after mitochondrial dysfunction. So it's really the, a first molecule going after multiple pathomechanisms within the disease of which we are then, again, taking a, a broader approach with uh, M102. So some data in terms of target engagement. Um, this is uh, uh, um, active, transcriptional activation from wild type 
uh, mouse spinal cord data, and you can see segregated uh, both into a set of NRF2 targets and HSF1 targets uh, over uh, a different um, uh, dosing levels here uh, on the right. And you can see where we have fold changes uh, in, uh, as compared to vehicle in terms of the, the gene expression for both targets on the NRF2 side of things as well as the HSF1 um, side of things. Also, uh, from those same wild type uh, animals, we also saw reduced glutathione in the cortex tissue from these animals uh, at both the five mg per kg and the 10 mg per kg uh, time frame. And this, you see data both at six hours and 24 hours. The data on the previous slide was 24 hours post-dose. Uh, so the, the red uh, bars here are matching the, at the same time frame as that target engagement data. So we're looking at glutathione as one of the biomarkers that we'll look at uh, in clinical trials as the molecule moves through clinical trials as a uh, identifier or quantifier of, of target engagement and, and other activity. Okay, so, so next I, I'm going to go on to the subject of induced astrocytes and induced motor neurons. So this is a technology that again, Pam and her team uh, uh, have been focused on within uh, the University of Sheffield, which is really taking uh, fibroblasts from MND patients, uh, primary fibroblasts, and programming them first into induced neuronal progenitor cells and then further programming those induced neuronal progenitor cells into induced astrocytes or induced motor neurons. And the important part of this technology is that those induced astrocytes and motor neurons retain the transcription features of the original adult donor and also retain the markings of maturity of that original donor. And it, it seems the, the data around many polypotent stem cell technologies is that the, the cells get um, more embryonic in state and you, you lose some of the phenotypic and genetic profile and maturity of the original donor. Here we're maintaining um, that maturity and genetic profile. And thus that gives us a platform to do a whole series of in vitro um, um, uh, testing on a patient by patient basis. So using those in this, in this slide, using induced astrocytes from the uh, uh, MND patients, we really looked at different, you know, and using RNA-seq, looked at differential gene expression in the cellular models of induced astrocytes versus controls. And so what, and we segregated this out into C9 patient um, uh, induced astrocytes, SOD1 patient induced astrocytes and sporadic uh, ALS patient astrocytes. And so you see here for a whole series of both uh, gene ontology uh, terms and how that matches into ALS pathomechanisms, the, the green uh, check marks are where we are seeing a statistically significant response of that uh, differential gene expression versus controls for those various gene ontology terms and, and matching pathomechanisms. So this was some of the earlier data that really got us better understanding the breadth of pathomechanisms that we were, uh, we believe we are addressing with the molecule. So again, using induced astrocytes, um, what we're showing here is uh, in sporadic uh, ALS induced astrocytes, uh, as, as you know, TDP43 is broken down into various toxic fragments, including 
uh, TDP 35, and it uh, is in a high level, uh, a numerous level of ALS patients. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is that, first of all, in the TDP 35 fragments uh, here on the left, that post-treatment over a 24-hour period, we are clearing the TDP 35 fragments from the induced astrocytes. This is an N of three. These experiments are ongoing and continuing to build the end so that we uh, have uh, a better understanding statistically uh, uh, in this as well. And also at the same time, we over that same 24 and 48 hour period, we're at least mathematically increasing the TDP 43 uh, healthy proteins as we uh, go through that time period. And again, expanding the, the uh, ends of these experiments uh, as we speak. So now, now going on to some mouse data. So this is in the TDP 43Q331, 331K mouse model. Um, and it's uh, a measurement of compound muscle action potential and electrophysiology measure. We also did Rotorard and, and many other experiments on these same mice. But uh, in terms of what I'm showing here on this graph is the CMAP data. On the y-axis, um, uh, below the zero line is disease progression. Above the zero line is potential disease reversal. Uh, and the experiment here, these mice don't gain the MND phenotype until a three-month period. Uh, and so this experiment was done uh, starting at, a uh, dosing started at 21 days when they reached maturity, but the actual data is from a, a analysis of six-month data versus three-month data after um, uh, after disease um, uh, in, is initiated within the model. So we see here in untreated mice that they continue in their disease progression. And at two different dosing regiments of M102, we are having the potential, uh, based upon this, of, of potentially stopping disease progression and or uh, reverting it back towards the healthy state. The healthy state is this 47% level uh, here shown um, uh, uh, at the dotted line is, is compound muscle action potential within um, uh, a healthy mouse. This was done uh, in a sub subcutaneous dosing, also some oral dosing uh, in some subsequent slides. We had Rilazole as part of this experiment. Uh, and so you can see the results from Rilazole here uh, in the, the last um, uh, bar uh, of the graph. What I'm going to show next is some human data. And I realize that this is an apple and orange comparison. Um, uh, and so, you know, certainly recognize that, but is the same y axis. And uh, electro CMAP and electrophysiology measurements we find very interesting because it's one of the few translational um, uh, measurements that one can take across species. So here I'm showing the uh, Adaverone phase three data, again, human data, but there is a specific uh, reference out there, the Bokenstein reference, that can take data from ALS FRS and based upon statistical methods, um, uh, make a correlation into CMAP data. That correlation was done for the Adaverone data uh, and then mapped on the same y-axis. So you see here that Adaverone slowed down by those measurements CMAP by roughly 30 or 35% uh, in its human data. And in a similar fashion, we looked at the Amelex phase two data uh, that is published at this point. And again, in a similar, did, did the same transformation uh, with the Bokenstein uh, references and mathematics uh, into CMAP to uh, do again the analysis here. So again, no surprise, there's a lot that can be uh, certainly uh, yet to be uh, improved in terms of treatment uh, within MND. 
So going on to some oral dosing. This is oral dosing in a SOD1 mouse model. Uh, we did this so that we could bridge uh, and the oral dosing form to the subcutaneous data uh, that you saw on previous slides. Uh, again, this is CMAP on the y-axis here of the, of the left graph, uh, uh, and the SOD1 control uh, continues in its disease progression. And then as we go through escalating oral dosing in the SOD1 mouse, we are continuing to increase um, the uh, uh, CMAP output uh, as you go to higher doses. And the 25 mg per kg oral dose here, uh, PO dose, is, is very similar um, exposure-wise to the 5 mg per kg subcutaneous dose that you saw on the previous slide. We had adaverone um, uh, administered here at its uh, 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 a uh, similar to its human dose in the mice, and then also the wild type mice you see here in, in the last. We also looked at weight um, uh, at over um, a 25 to 89 a day period. Uh, and again, you see that as the PO doses go up, the weights of the animals go up. Uh, Adavrone had a statistically significant increase in weight during the experiments, as did the wild type mice, as did the highest PO dose of M102. Okay, so going back um, into in vitro, uh, no, I take this back. This is again mouse data uh, from the SOD1 mouse model. Um, where we have the same PO doses from the previous slide. And here, what we were looking at uh, was really the uh, number of uh, spinal motor neurons um, within the experiment at the various doses from, as harvested from the animals. And uh, again, you see, uh, as we go from vehicle through the different doses of M102, uh, to the wild type mice, uh, you know, the, the number of uh, rescued motor neurons increases in various statistical um, uh, robust fashions. Okay, so moving on, um, we have, as we move into the clinic with this molecule, uh, really a taking a very hard look at all the different biomarkers that we could use as we run through both healthy volunteer trials and um, uh, hopefully uh, MND patient trials. And it's helped us sort of think through things to segregate those biomarkers into three different buckets. The target engagement biomarkers, the pharmacodynamic biomarkers, and what I'll get to on the next slide, the patient stratification biomarkers. And so uh, in our SAD-MAD trial, we uh, expect to only get target engagement biomarkers. Um, the MAD part of it will not be long enough. There's an ALS patient cohort as part of the MAD, but still we don't expect the 14-day dosing uh, to result in any, uh, we'll take measurements, but we don't expect pharma pharmacodynamic output of any significance from that although we're building our case as we then move into a phase two. And as, as this audience you know, well knows, uh, we and many others look at the FDA's accelerated approval of Quasati based upon neurofilm at light as a, a super, super important um, benchmark for um, development of therapeutics and for the industry in the whole uh, as we drive forward. So going on here to the patient stratification biomarkers, what we're doing here is again, out of those induced astrocytes that were taken on a patient by patient basis from MND patients. And so the you know, astrocytes control motor neuron survival. And so what was done with the induced astrocytes is that they were co-cultured with mouse motor neurons and the survival of those motor neurons were assessed. 
Using that data, we then were able uh, to segregate, based upon the motor neuron survival, the ALS patient cell lines into ones that we believe are potential responders or strong responders to M102 and uh, patient um, lines that we believe are weak responders or non-responders to M102. And so you're seeing the RNA-seq profile from eight patients uh, and four healthy controls here in the, the untreated uh, profile. We right now are adding 16 uh, sporadic ALS patient data to this data set. So um, in a number of months, we'll have roughly 25 uh, that were, uh, again, we, we have the, the lines established. We're doing the experiments to better quantify things uh, as we speak. So if we take that strong responder group then and treat them in this in vitro experiments with M102, post-treatment, you get RNA-seq profiles that you see in this box here. And at least qualitatively, they are tending back towards the RNA-seq profile that one sees in the healthy controls. If you take the weak responder group and treat them with M102, there really is very little effect in that the RNA-seq profiles post-treatment are very similar to the pre-treatment RNA-seq profiles. So we know now um, that so first of all, there were 99 transcripts that were identified that define a strong responder versus a weak responder. And of those 99 transcripts, there are eight of them that we can see in high enough levels pre-dose in human PBMCs. And so, um, our goal here as we move forward is the potential of developing a stratification for the strong responders as we drive forward based upon a gene sequence that we would look for pre-dose in human PBMCs. And also uh, there's work going on right now to really take the focusing on those eight genes and much better tie them into uh, ALS pathomechanisms and just understand the significance of those eight genes to a greater degree and also see if we can take that eight and move it down to a smaller number, three or four, that then could be a potential patient stratification uh, biomarker screen. Um, right now, our data says that really there's a degree of uh, response in all ALS patients and that degree changes. There's a, 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 a uh, there are varying degrees of response that again, we're working to better understand, but that out of that varying levels of response, 50% are strong responders. And one of the reasons uh, that we're going this direction is can we do better patient stratification? And there's data um, uh, in the industry, mostly from cancer, that says if you can ultimately have a companion diagnostic, can ultimately stratify your patient population for responders, that you increase your probability of clinical success by twofold to threefold. And so we're continuing to build this data set and understand this data set. So the next step here is uh, an ALS, uh, I'm sorry, a SAD MAD trial in healthy volunteers. Uh, this is the design of that trial, uh, a relatively straightforward SAD MAD trial uh, that we're planning to uh, initiate in Australia uh, later this year. Uh, you know, doing your, your, your typical uh, single dose escalation, a food effect, um, piece of the trial, and then uh, multiple dose trial. And we're looking at the last cohort being MND patients, 
to get some basic data, target engagement data and PK data in addition to the safety data from MND patients. We especially you know, want to understand the PK between the healthy volunteers uh, and the patients um, you know, as we drive this program forward. And then based upon this data, we would hopefully then move into a phase two. So just some um, additional sort of competitive landscape data. This is uh, in the uh, induced motor neurons that I, I talked about before and looking at motor neuron survival. So uh, induced motor neurons were, were, were programmed out of uh, the fibroblasts from MND patients. And you can see here, we have C9 patients uh, on the x-axis, SOD1 patients and sporadic patients. Uh, and we're looking at the rescue of the motor neurons, M102 rescued motor neurons in seven of the nine patients, Rilazole in four of the nine, Adavarone in three of the seven, and MMF, which is the uh, active in Tecfidera, which is also a NRF2 activator. Um, which had a, a human trial within Australia. Uh, again, that uh, rescued uh, a smaller set of patient cells. We're also now expanding this data set, uh, especially really focused on the sporadic um, uh, uh, ALS patient um, uh, cells. So we do see upsides uh, for NRF2 uh, and an HSF1 activator in other diseases. Uh, as you see here. And so uh, again, as we go forward, we'll continue and we'll develop additional in vitro and animal data in these diseases um, to better position them for next steps clinically as, as we go down the road. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, everyone here. Certainly wanna thank Fight MND uh, for their support of the program. We also have other uh, external funders from the US DOD and from the UK's Medical Research Council, uh, which has supported the program uh, along with Eclipse and my various uh, colleagues uh, at Eclipse, as well as Pam uh, and her team at Sheffield, especially Richard Mead, Laura Ferraglio, Raquel uh, Roa Martins, and, and Evie Lenshear, uh, who have really helped uh, all of us in driving the program forward uh, and doing the science uh, behind uh, M102 and its biology. And on the NRF2 and HSF1 side of things, we also have collaborators uh, from Antonio Corrado and Alberta Dinka Kosova, uh, who are really very, very much expert scientists in NRF2 and uh, HSF1 biology. So thank you very much. And I guess I'll stop here and turn it back to the. Yeah. Turn it back to Sarah or Devor. OK. Yeah, double. Yes. Hi. Thanks. Thanks, Ray. I really appreciate uh, you taking us through the uh, development of M102 and, and the data there and the applicability of uh, progression through to uh, a trial uh, commencing 2024 potentially. So um, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, we're going there. <laughs> yeah, terrific, terrific to see and hear about that progression as well. Um, I, before I'd like to just open it up the presentation to questions. So just uh, reaffirming Sarah's instructions of uh, just um, enabling your camera and um, and introducing who you are. Uh, to, to Ray, and we've also got Ning online as well for, for further technical questions as well from, from Eclipse One. And uh, as a start off, as a start off question, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to your you know kind of interesting data on the biomarker panel and and uh, patient stratifications um, and strong responders as well based on the RNA seq profiles. Um, just a question on the time frame for that in terms of using it uh, in real time for for um, for diverting uh, strong responders through to through to trials and 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 also subsequent use as well. How long is the time frame to, would be the time frame from getting the data from your um, from your the blood samples you would, the PBMCs through to then being able to actually use that data. Um, 
to um, you know to stratified patients and use the strong responders. So, so let let me address that, and and I I probably need to say something I should could have said or should have said in the presentation. The induced astrocyte induced motor neuron work is a tool okay and we're using it as a tool to ultimately um have us be able to identify the you know a set of genes that we can see pre-dose so the implementation of the tool side of that both from a programming of the induced astrocytes and motor neurons as well as all the RNA seq and the bioinformatics and, and many, many things is very labor intensive. But the, uh, the goal of getting those eight genes or getting it down to three or four genes that we can see in PBMCs, once that is, uh, once those are identified and, and quantitated, and I'll come to the quantitation here in a second, uh, getting them from a blood sample and seeing them in a genetic profile pre-dose is something that happens in you know happens uh, in other disease areas day in and day out so that's a 24 48 hour uh, a turnaround on a test from a laboratory to look at that blood sample so that's something that we can certainly do in any run up period before dosing but now let me go into the, the clinical quantification, for lack of a better word. So um, although our goal ultimately is patient stratification, um, if we look forward to whether it's the MAD cohort of, of the phase one study or uh, much more importantly, a phase two study, a phase two study, we are not going to do any sort of patient stratification. We'll take all the data, take the PBMCs, take actually the, the, the uh, uh, um, uh, patient fibroblasts so that we have that data if, uh, and freeze it if, so that we can access it at a later time so uh, if we need to or want to. But nevertheless, the phase two is going to be all comers responders or, or weak responders, strong responders. And, um, and the goal of that is really, and we do want both types of uh, responders or all responders in that phase two trial, because we wanna look post uh, trial uh, at the data and see if there are treatment effects that correspond to the group that we believe are strong responders versus the group that we believe are weak responders. And so it's very important for us to have both those data sets as correlated to the various biomarker outputs and other you know, primary secondary endpoints that we get in a phase two trial to better understand the robustness of the technology and question, you know, could it be used in later trials? Um, as a real patient stratification. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your response there. Just um, looking to, you know, again, looking to how we can best stratify and then uh, demonstrate kind of efficacy of, um, of uh, you know, trial results in, in, in um, you know, be able to stratify results as well and the progression on that using biomarkers. So thank you. Uh, we have a question from Adam Walker from, from the University of Queensland. Adam. Uh, hi, thanks, Davo, and, and thanks, Ray. Um, yeah, I have a question about uh, you, if you have any thoughts on the recent failure of the Amalex drug in the phase three after it was approved based on the NFL uh, biomarker primarily in the phase two, what kind of implications do you think that has for, for your trials or future ALS trials in, in general? Well, I uh, certainly it's it's sad for patients that the the trial failed. It certainly failed spectacularly, you know, as, as you well know. Uh, and and again, I think we just need more data to understand that, Adam, because I'll be very curious uh, you know, I, I'm hoping and I would expect that as we go out, out over the next two, three, four or five months, that more data will come out and lots of people will be analyzing 
the differences in trial populations and everything between the you know the phase two data that Amelex produced uh, and that phase three data set. So you know I think you know my only crystal ball is I think the FDA at least as that regulatory agency uh, uh, will be um, uh, more uh, tougher I don't know more 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 conservative uh, you know as they go forward and yet. You know, the Corsati data, you know, you spoke about NFL, the Corsati mm -hmm. data on NFL, you know, showed, uh, at least in my view of it, a pretty clear um, response at three to four months that forecast a 12 month clinical benefit. Now, again, that was only in SOD1 genetically mutated patients, so uh, a narrow slice of patients. So, does that mean anything in other patient populations? you know, to be determined, but um, I still have, uh, you know, uh, and and certainly, um, you know, others of our team, and I don't want to put words in, in Pam and others' mouths, but I think everybody is still very um, uh, pro um, the, the potential applicability of NFL um, as we all go forward. All right, thank you. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Adam. We've got a uh, question from Sarah at Vitamin D. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, this is not really a technical question, but just sort of a general one. Um, you obviously have some really great um, professional ties with Citran and, um, you know, sort of the basic biology um, groups there. I'm just wondering if you have any advice uh, to the audience on, on, on you know, the, that working relationship and how, and how more people can sort of uh, marry that basic uh, research groups with with this more translational work. Okay, well, I, I'll take a crack at that, and Ning, you can jump in here. Um, one, we've had, and in, in certainly from my view, a incredibly successful and diligent working relationship with Citran. They've been great. Um, uh, and we've worked hand in hand on this program um, since, you know, the inception, at least the inception from our side of things in, in uh, licensing it from the University of Sheffield. And so from a segregation of labor, so to speak, of tasks, maybe put it that way, um, you know, the, the Citran team has been, you know, uh, they obviously understood the, the, the biology and found the molecule as as we spoke before, uh, but they've really much continued it, the the animal models um, and the um, in vitro models that you saw in this presentation and uh, the other data that we have are predominantly from uh, from Citran and all of the ongoing patient stratification biomarker work again is happening within Citran. In terms of Eclipse, you know, we've been sort of the drug development side of things to their sort of more basic uh, biological and uh, research side in that we've done uh, all of the non-tox, uh, um, uh, non-GMP toxicology originally, all the GMP toxicology, all the manufacturing we've been responsible for uh, and conducted and all the regulatory interactions um, um, we have. And from the clinical trial perspective, it's, you know, us that are, are from a sponsor perspective conducting the clinical trial. So in terms of advice, I just say, you, you know, find good groups that really, uh, you know, and, and again, one of the truthfully joys of MND and the, and the joys of, of orphan diseases uh, 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 is that, you know, the, the physicians and the researchers in the area are there for the patients. And that's a tremendous um, benefit to their, in my humble opinion, their heads in the right place, you know, and so the, 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 that's a tremendous benefit from a development standpoint, uh, uh, and working relations standpoint of just getting everyone on the same page. So, uh, and we've done that consistently and we're continuing to do that. Ning, any other comments? Uh, sure. So, uh, my name's Ning Xian. I'm the, uh, chief scientific officer at Eclipse. As what Ray just mentioned about, I 
I really regard our collaboration with uh, Citroen as a very successful one. I mean, uh, I'm one of the, uh, the few people has uh, like a weekly meetings with Citroen and I uh, really appreciate the like a scientist to scientist conversations. And uh, I think that's probably the key and uh, to gain respect from the academia and continue our collaboration very successfully. So I really appreciate this collaboration. So. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question online from uh, Beck Sangil from the University of Queensland. Uh, Beck was uh, wanting to ask whether you have any omics data from brain or spinal cord in the mouse experiments, um, and if there's any clear NRF2 HS1 target engagement from mm -hmm. those. Ning, I thought we showed a slide to that. There was NR uh, uh, again. Uh, well, maybe the question is from the QD yeah. from the SOD one mice and or the TDP forty three mice. The slide I showed was wild type mice target engagement. So, Ning, on the if I understand the question correctly, um, so uh, the boy you, you read a question. So if I understand the question correctly, you are talking about target engagement in the uh, spinal cord of the like uh, M and D um, rodent models. Yes, if, from the if that's from the a question. Uh, I don't think Ray has shown the data for the uh, TDB forty three uh, mice, and the answer is yes. Uh, we have shown target engagement in the spinal cord. And um, we are actually preparing a paper uh, combine, combining all the preclinical data. And then um, hopefully that paper will be ready by the end of uh, May. And we're going to submit it to a prestigious, like a reputable uh, journal, and then um, be available to the uh, scientific work. So. Fantastic. Look forward to that uh, article and the paper and the, and, the, and uh, kind of. The results as well. Um, appreciate that. That was a question I was going to refer to as well. So thanks for, for, <laughs> for asking that one. Um, I'm going to go down back to a kind of a more kind of a general question with regards to the M102 molecule itself. Um, the, um, the 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 paper that was uh, published uh, in Nature last year um, referred to it as a dopamine agonist. Um, and, and with some weak ag antagonist activity as well. My, my question just comes back to, have you done any assessment of its potential for of activ activating the reward pathways or, or hallucination in your mouse models um, and any potential for that going forward in the, in the human trials? Yeah. Um, so I just want to confirm that there are two enantiomers for uh, apomorphine. And the uh, the R apomorphin, which has been commercialized right now, is a dopamine. Uh, it's a strong dopamine agonist. Well, M102 is the S enantiomer of the undermarket drug, which is a dopamine, a very weak dopamine antagonist. So the uh, dopamine agonism and antagonism has been confirmed in the literature as well as. Uh, our internal research data, and so that's the that's the first thing, and so uh, therefore, like uh, our drug will not have any of the adverse events, like uh, caused by our apomorphine or like uh, in the U at least in the U.S. the brand name as the Um I I didn't get the second part of your question. So does that answer um, your question? I just want to yeah, make sure. Yeah, it just, but it just, yes, it does answer the question. I was just referring to whether, um, whether other systems would be affected by by the M one M one hundred two compounds. So it, it seems like you've taken that into consideration, uh, judging by right. the structure of the compound. Yeah, and we've also done all the secondary pharmaco, you know, uh, PK um and, and pd analyses from a secondary farm perspective so we have all that data um and that data actually has uh, already been in front of the fda and will be in you know as part of any um ctn filing as an example so that's all known thank you thank you i'll uh, i'll throw to sarah now right thank you so much um 
Thank you, Ray, for taking the time at the end of the day over there in the US uh, to speak with our audience. And, and, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shan, for joining her for the discussion session. Um, if there is anything else you would like to follow up with Ray Ning and the team at Eclipse, you can get in touch directly with them uh, or get in touch with us at FindMD if you would like us to help you connect. Um, this seminar has been recorded today, so um, if you do know anyone who wasn't able to attend live but would like to catch up, um, let them know that this uh, recording will be available on our website and on YouTube uh, in a few days' time. Um, so thank you again for joining us today for the March Friday MIDI Scientific Seminar. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. Uh, please do join us again next month when we will have a new speaker. Uh, keep a lookout in your emails for news on this seminar, which will take place on Tuesday, April 23rd. Um, so have a good day, everyone. Thank you again, um, and we'll speak to you shortly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you, Ray and Ning. I hope you um are, are you, you can go home soon. <laughs> it's getting uh, fairly late there. I'm not sure what time it is, but uh, probably time 10 for 10 p.m. on the East Coast, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, uh, have a good rest. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Lovely okay. to meet you. Mm -hmm. Same Bye. here.